Well, welcome everyone. I know I'm really excited to, to be here with everyone today. This is the second part of a, of a conversation that we started in our last session that I'm excited to continue. I really like these ones where I get to learn some new things and where our guests have some really great conversations that give me kind of tangible actions that I can implement with the work that I do here um, in Cleveland with our ecosystem and in supporting other ecosystems. So welcome back to part two of this conversation with ecosystem leaders about building and sustaining partnerships with business and industry. It's such a critical, critical component. I, I think it is arguably the most critical component of the work that the ecosystems do because without our partners, we have trouble doing the work that we do because they provide all sorts of support. And maybe even more importantly, they provide a lot of the guidance for what we need to know uh, for the things that we need to pass along to the young people in the school districts in the region to make sure that all youth in our areas are prepared for STEM careers and non-STEM careers. At the end of spring this year, we spoke with ecosystem leaders about how ecosystems could be maintaining strong partnerships with business and industry in their community. And today we're joined by XAM Black, former leader of the Tulsa Regional STEM Alliance, now working with Ties to support STEM ecosystems. Exan gets it. She fundamentally understands how successful ecosystems are maintained, and we saw that in her work with Tulsa. And she'll be my co-moderator for today's discussion. We also have with us Reginald McGregor, our friend Reginald, leader of the Indiana STEM ecosystem and a member of the Defense Engineering Operations Management Team within Rolls-Royce North America, one of the longest titles of anyone I know. Uh, Reginald's also on the school board in his area. Reginald has a pulse in both industry and education, truly understanding how to bridge those connections. And last but certainly not least, our longtime friend Kathleen Schofield, leader of the Northeast Florida STEM2 hub. Kathleen was uh, recently recognized by a million women mentors for her work advancing opportunities in STEM for girls and women in Florida. And she's built a thriving ecosystem based on strong community trust across stakeholders, including the business and industry folks that we'll be talking about today. As so many of you know, business and industry is a huge stakeholder within a community and critical to the success of ecosystems. These are future employers for young people, mentors working in STEM fields, and these partners help us understand where the technology is headed. As a refresher, I wanna briefly remind some folks about a couple of important points from the last time we were together. Uh, please note that the first conversation and a downloadable summary is available on our website. Veronica is going to add a link in the chat to that momentarily if she hasn't already. So first, we spoke about getting connected with your business partners. Who are they? How do we approach them as real people? What are, what are the, the language barriers that we, that we hit when uh, we come perhaps from a different area, different vertical than business and industry, and how do we cross those? Number two, after building an initial relationship, how are we, um, how do we let them know about community needs? And number three, how do we thank people for their time and keep them included? In other words, how do we maintain that relationship? There's so many great things that we discussed and I, I can't wait to dive in. Uh, before we get started, I wanna remind everyone of a few things. Please first use that uh, uh, chat button down there to back channel and talk about whatever you're thinking about, seeing, feeling, ideas you have, thoughts you have, um, our, our best conversations uh, have a, a really active chat where people are talking about their experiences and our panelists will also jump in there while they're not speaking as well. Secondly, and more importantly for me than the chat, is you've got that little Q&A button down at the bottom. If you've never used that before, go ahead and click on it right now. Uh, you have the ability to ask a question there. If you have a question, there's a really, really good chance that someone else has the same question. So don't be afraid. Please ask those questions. And we'll get to as many as we can. Even if you don't have a question, whether or not you have questions, make sure you keep an eye on that Q&A button because you can view the questions that other people have asked and you can give them a little thumbs up, which upvotes them on our end. And if we end up with not enough time to answer every question, that kind of helps us know which ones are resonating with the most people. So please make sure that you're voting on those questions as well. All right, uh, Xan, um, talk to us, to get us started here. I, I know we've got a couple of, of really great uh, thought leaders. So where's our conversation going today and what are we gonna learn about as we discuss today? be so great. We're going to just touch on a couple of really key points from the last webinar and then we're going to shoot straight into how to maintain the relationship once we have that business partner on board and then secret sauce, right? Like how to leverage that relationship to gain even more business partners. 
So here's the here's the pitch. Why beat around the bush, right? Like Reginald, Kathleen, is there a silver bullet pitch with business partners that's going to work every time? And on the flip side, is there one that's like, hold my popcorn because this is going to be real bad like this? This is going to go down in flames. What are the things that you see ecosystem leaders or nonprofits? And it's like, that's going to be bad. So um, I'll jump into that with the what not to do. Hi, I'm Kathleen. We're doing the greatest work on the planet and we need your support. <clears throat> Write me a check and we'll do great things, right? It's right. not, it can't start there. Um, many of you know me from convenings. Um, our org was formed by the business community for the sake of building that bridge between education, nonprofits, community leaders, and the business community for two reasons, social responsibility and for economic prosperity for the kids who live and work in our communities. So there's got to be why. And Jan has called it, and ecosystems have called it enlightened self-interest. But that's really what this is all about. It's understanding not just the gift of that check, which is important, but what does this business do? How do I understand this business, the jobs in there, and what they have that may even be non-monetary that can really help advance kids towards that end goal. Um, I happen to be sitting in a board member company right now for this call. I'm here in Jacksonville at Audit Max and Audit Max runs um, the operations. They're an outsourcing company for the operations of your network from getting computers, managing the life, science, uh, life cycle of the computer, recycling them out at the end of life. Well, where does that bridge for us? We're working on closing the digital divide. So here, Audit Mac from all kinds of businesses, and we have different arrangements with them where we can get refurbished computers from them to go into the hands of children. We can um, set up where if the computers just need to be scrapped for parts, that sets up a fund for us to purchase computers. So all that long answer to say, what is that warm spot that interfaces between what does this business do what do we do that we can work on together as a unified face, but then also what can our kids learn about the careers here? So yes, we can lump, we nonprofits and educators can lump all of business community into this bucket called business community, but to build the relationship as much as we want them to understand our mission and our work, we need to understand their vision and their work then you find your synergy and you find how to build a wonderful relationship. You know what I love about that, Kathleen, is that um, there are people like me out there who, listen, <laughs> Jan, Alyssa, Veronica, they all know, I'm a really bad hard seller, like really bad. Um, I would be the worst salesperson that, that has ever existed. But what, I, what I'm good at and what I think a lot of the people in the ecosystem are good at is the, the soft sell. They know, we, they, they know we want money from them. They're aware already. So just having those conversations about what they need and where the gaps are can really build those relationships. I, I wonder, Kathleen, if you can tell us um, uh, an example of a, of a partner you've worked with and what that conversation was like and, and what they needed um, when you had that conversation. What, what did they tell you that they, that they needed? So, okay, I'll look at, um, and I'll also ask Reginald, what does Rolls Royce do with their end of life computers? Cause I could hook you up here with Audit Max. <laughs> and, and, and although that sounds like I'm being um, facetious, what I'm really doing is looking at an opportunity where I'm looking for more than just Reginald, I would love you to make a donation to my org. I may be I may be able to be the catalyst that helps solve a problem that Reginald has. Maybe he's not doing, um, maybe he doesn't have a responsible way to recycle their end of life computers. Maybe he doesn't um, know that those assets 
can be used to either generate funds or technology to get into the hands of children. And that's kind of a perfect example of what can uncover from a conversation. From my viewpoint, because I understand that Rolls-Royce probably has employees with computers, I know there's something there that I can help benefit a board member company and benefit my program and build a new pathway to getting Reginald to say, oh, I want to learn more about how you're closing the digital divide. So when I understand common needs in the sector, I can look at opportunities to engage. Then Reginald may say, hey, Reginald, and this is not a spoofed conversation. I'd love to have your support, right? I can say, I can, he can see, and then he may say, hey, well, we have these hundred computers. It might not be much, but let's try this. Then he sees that then maybe he sends some of his direct reports to come out when we do the workshop where we teach the kids about the computers and get them logged on. And then he sees more about us Then maybe he wants to visit a board meeting or maybe he wants to know how can we get involved more? What else can we do? And that, I, and I hope that kind of answers your question, Jeremy, is you look for, it's gotta be win, win, win for everybody because there are so many worthy nonprofits out there and worthy organizations solving huge societal problems. So how can, while you're helping me, how can I help you? And how can we work together really on something that's not necessarily that heavy lift? And then the relationship builds and then the engagement can go many different ways. So Reginald, we can have a follow-up call. I love that. I love that. Absolutely. Like, seizing the moment. Way to go, Kathleen. <laughs> yeah. like, I didn't know this was that. what this was going to be about. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. What do you yeah. say, Reginald? Hey, you know what? You make a good point, Kathleen. So let's just think about our industry partners across the nation coming out of the pandemic. Most of us have now went into a virtual space. And as you can imagine, some of your large companies, we have a we have excess paper, notebooks, staplers, pens, pencils, dry erase boards, you name it, any office supplies that you can think of. So fortunate here in Indiana, we have a group, we have an organization called Teachers Treasure, but, but just think about all this excess equipment that companies, we, we never, of course, we don't know who to send this stuff to. So like even in Rolls Royce, even though we have Teachers Treasures, we have about three conference rooms full of monitors, full of staplers, full of notebooks, paper, just full of it. And of course, the question becomes, so how do we... So what do we do with this equipment? What do we do with this with these materials and supplies? And you always think, oh, we can maybe send it to a school district. But as an ecosystem, be proactive and, hey, reach out and say, as we understand that you are moving to your virtual space, if you do have any supplies that can be beneficial to think about the students that we serve in some of our communities who might not have notebooks, or if there's any even equipment that you thought that you thought about, that we'll be more than willing to help you find, if not, if we can't use it, we'll help you find those who could definitely use those materials. That is a good conversation to have with any industry partner. In addition to that, I always talk about, so really we're trying to make, we're trying to, we're trying to connect, not necessarily connect the industry, but we're trying to connect the people inside that, that industry. So first and foremost, always know, always know what I do as an industry partner in your neighborhood. You got to make sure you do that research. So you can start talking about, as I've looked and seen some of the work you've done in, let's just say, uh, robotics, uh, keep in mind, we have some programs that, that, that we could also help you touch a different set of students. In fact, we would be willing to speak to you about some opportunities where some of your employees can come and mentor or facilitate some of our training as, again, a, just another way to touch base, uh, making that connection. So, absolutely. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? The rest comes. Like I can tell you, not just you know our own work, but in our ecosystem, we have wonderful education foundations that sit side by side the district, and we collaborate with them. And um, the teacher treasure, like you have, we have 
similar the teacher depot where they can come yep. <laughs> and something as simple as i mean 500 pads of paper means Correct. the world to the teacher <laughs> depot it means the world and then some of your staff maybe come help the day that the teacher depot is open and they see that engagement and then the relationship builds it comes down to those personal relationships and then that builds the trust that you are a good steward of the paper or the computers or right. the funds or the talent. You know, we always hear time, talent, treasure, and those things are all interconnected and intertwined. Absolutely. Love that. I love building that relationship and understanding that like any relationship that's going to take time. And I, I appreciate that. I appreciate looking for that win-win where we're both winning. Um, I wonder once, once you're on our team, like we're all in this huddle, you're with us, you're for us. We love each other relationship now, like for the long haul, right? Because we don't want to be a one and done. We want to keep you in this. So what are some surefire yet simple ways that ecosystem leaders can nurture those relationships as time goes by? One is to be one is to be proactive in in terms of the strategy. Always always keep us involved. To, as as your strategy change, how does it align to my strategy? Also, start talking to me about. As you start thinking about staying on board with us, here's another area that we would like to have some input of maybe some different engagements. Uh, if not with the current mentors or current facilitators, if some maybe some of your senior leaders can get involved with some of the things we can do as we expand reaching out to other industry partners and as we expand to uh, I call it a greater reach of students. Uh, so we would like to invite maybe two or three year leaders to come in and maybe just sit in a session with us as we talk about how we move forward with our strategy to better uh, engage students, parents, and really the entire community. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And um, and Veronica, although she's not on camera, she's going to smile because the one big thing I learned from Veronica was communicate, communicate, communicate. Mm -hmm. And with that social media, with that keying on certain things that the greater community is interested in, I cannot tell you just from sharing a little bit of what we did or a little bit of this or that new partners pick up on that because the people out there doing the business work in the community want to help but sometimes they don't know how so when you share what you're doing it sometimes sparks the interest of somebody who's ready to roll up their sleeves and help and even if they're not a person who's ultimately going to fund the work, they may work for a company that funds the work. And um, and so that communication, that it is worth the time. And that's been my biggest learning curve during this pandemic, because you can't, we couldn't for all that time be out going to the community meetings, going to the tech council meeting and all of that. So how do we keep you aware that, hey, we've accommodated, we've adapted, we're expanding, we have our social media, we have our direct communication, newsletters, all of that are so important. In the chat, uh, Eric Jackson was talking about some things that, that, um, that he's done. Eric, I was wondering if you could share uh, the, the things that you've done with business and industry as well. Lucky Maybe Eric walked mute. away for a yeah. second. Um, so uh, Eric, jump in if, if you if you hear me and you you get unmuted. Okay, yeah. There you Actually, are, Eric. God bless you. So I don't have not on my photograph, but um, yeah. So I'm a retired English uh, teacher, and um, but I, I've worked on doing some STEM curriculum development, uh, in particular doing some STEAM and in, or arts integration, and I use the word leverage because. Oftentimes we have plenty of industrial and business companies in our in our location, especially in the urban area. And many of them come in and get tax breaks, but don't put back into the community. So we can go directly to those companies. And as I just put in the chat, ask them about doing virtual tours, live tours, um, doing career days, 
and I was working on a sentence. We have George Washington Carver's and Ernest Everett Just right in the city. That may that may be the next person to deal with, you know, agriculture or marine biology and zoology and so forth, especially with climate change. So, to introduce, particularly in urban areas, but other um, school locales, to some what I would say somewhat non-traditional careers. And we can't come with a bias as professionals and teachers saying, no, they don't, they're not gonna be interested in agriculture, but that's not, that's not the case. So just trying to mix up, um, again, introduce those, those types of, of uh, professions across the board, just like we talk about across the curriculum, we need to not have a, a, those biases that only certain kinds of occupations regarding STEM only fit certain kinds of school uh, districts and locales. Totally Thank agree. You. There's nothing like letting our kids see professionals from different STEM careers in our city. Like there's, that is golden. And, and to me, that's just a huge thing that our business partners accomplish for us that we can't conjure up on our own. So hats off to you, that's awesome that you're doing that. I wonder too, like as we, are nurturing this relationship from time to time. It happens that people get transferred or they take another job, blah, 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 blah. So I wonder if Reginald and Kathleen, y'all could talk about how important those other internal advocates are for us within a business because gosh, if Reginald's my bestie, but Reginald moves to someplace else, I could be dead in the water. So what should I do as an ecosystem leader to really try to you know, foster other internal advocates for myself and my organization within a business? Xan, hey, we see this a lot, actually, uh, on both sides. Like, I've had wonderful partnerships with a true champion in a STEM organization doing wonderful work. That person moves on or that person retires or whatever the case may be. And all of a sudden, our relationship just come to a screeching halt. So it happens on both sides. And in, 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 in the industry space, as we try to rotate and get more mentors involved, more facilitators engaged, you're trying to develop those relationships with those individuals. Now, there are certain times when, you know, a champion leave, the program leaves, that happens. And when I see that in a particular organization, I try to reach, especially if it's like the STEM leader, but they're still like, say, a vice president or president of the organization or executive director. I try to reach back out to the executive director and say, hey, so we've been a partner with you guys for the last five years. Uh, I haven't heard from you all for a year, just trying to fully understand what is taking place before we actually remove you from our, you know, from our target partners. And, and, and I try to say that so they can say, so they can understand this is not just a, well, we'll get back to you. But yeah, but there's this conversation that you could be removed from our, one of our target strategic partners, because there's others who's, who, who, who we like to partner with if, if possible. And so we try to have that conversation. And in some cases, it's, it's tough to replace a true champion. It's tough. And I understand that. So I always work with that executive director to say, well, until you find a permanent replacement, if there's any way that we can continue to work with your students or continue to work with that program, we open to that. Uh, now, when that happens inside the industry, again, it could be the same conversation. Yes, we used to have a person that was over our STEM outreach is no longer with the company. Uh, so hopefully you've developed some relationship because a lot of times, even though there's a true manager of the outreach, that is not usually the person that's on the ground. So you hopefully you have developed a relationship with those people who are inside your facilities or on the ground with you and they can help you. Oh, yeah, so and so uh, left. But here's the new person that you want to get involved with. And I and I bridge and I'll make that introduction for you. That's usually the best way to try to do that. Now, likewise, from my side, from our original board members, we've had some of those leaders who have retired or moved on. And when we see that that's coming, as simple as have you thought about who's going to take your board seat or who's going to um, be our new point of contact when you retire? And you know we're big on identifying fail fast around here. And there's been times when I have not known who that person is because I wasn't five months ahead proactively looking for that and building a deeper relationship that goes 
layers into the org and we've lost you know engagement from a couple companies because of that then it's very hard to go back once you've lost that engagement whereas in cases where I knew this person was retiring. We had um, a secession plan, almost like you do in when you're leaving your job, you make sure that you know who's taking your job or making sure everything is in place. So for the key work that um, business leaders do outside of their contracted job, their impact really has to be part of how they look at themselves and how we as a partner would look at them. And in cases where we've nurtured the deeper relationships, the transition has been not only seamless, but in some cases actually expansive. And um, and that's thrilling to me. You know, sometimes we can be like, no, that's my contact, but I have found when um, I open up the doors and let our partners in the ecosystem come and share their work with my board, it deepens engagement with those other orgs, which is good for them, but it's good for us overall because it's getting us closer to where we need to go. It doesn't matter to me if let's say um, CSX is one of my board members, they're wonderful. And we toured a facility recently and heard from an Ed Foundation. And my board member asked for an introduction to both of those so that they could see how they could further help. And to me, that's not, I don't go, oh no, he wants to talk to them instead of me. I go, wow, how awesome. I'm gonna take a step back, make that introduction. I'm here to help and support. But now what are you going to grow over here? Because, you know, if we think about our ecosystem growing, and then who does that partner know that can just like, like the ripple in the water, you throw the pond, the pebble in the pond, you know, the more we share and the more the business community sees that educators and other nonprofits are working together, not competing, that deeper impact and get more done. I love the attention that you're paying to the health of the network. You know, I think that will always pay off in spades because it's what's actually going to get the work done. Like there's, there's no other way unless we use that force multiplication of actually functioning as an ecosystem. So yes. And yes. And that's that trust piece, right? That's yeah. the trust piece. So Kathy, the people, yeah, the trust works in every direction. I'm sorry, Jeremy. No, no, it's okay. Um, I, I, you've got, I think, a little bit of a, a bandwidth issue, Kathy. So there's like a tiny bit of delay. So I apologize for jumping on your words there. Um, but that does really bring to you know, I, I, I know that everyone in in this audience really likes to think about practicals, and and I'm amongst them. So um, you know, most of you know that uh, in addition to my uh. SLECOP work that I work with the, the ecosystem here locally in Cleveland a little bit. And we shifted our conversation uh, at our most recent meeting last week uh, to be about trust, uh, not just as a setup to, to the things you just said. The reason we did that is because we realized that we don't really have it yet. And, and I want to be clear that, that there's a difference between lack of trust and mistrust. We don't have mistrust either. But because this ecosystem, the Cleveland ecosystem, has been sort of revitalized in the last two years, um, which also coincides with none of these people ever being in a room together, um, the trust just isn't, isn't there yet. So we had kind of a side conversation. We, we had people sort of break out and talk about the, um, you know, what they need to build trust and then try to kind of commit to doing with partners and all those things. But but I wonder with your ecosystem, Kathy, and then and then Reginald after Kathy answers, I, I also wonder from, from a business perspective, what specifically have you done uh, in Florida? And I'm wearing my favorite Florida bookstore t-shirt right now. Um, what have you done specifically in Florida to build trust amongst 
your people. So not necessarily even you out, but your, you know, the people in the ecosystem to each other. Yeah, well, collaboration has been key. There was a day when, so for anyone who doesn't know, I worked directly with seven school districts in Northeast Florida or seven counties, I'm going to call it, because it's bigger than the school districts. University system is involved, business, other nonprofits. So that's my direct span. And then we reach out from there, working with the other ecosystems, working with other organizations um, that have structure. But it was almost like seven kingdoms, seven counties. And even though they're all part of Jack's USA um, partnership, it was still seven kingdoms functioning in their own way. Now, if you, through collaboration, through cross-stakeholder meetings, through getting us all to think about things through the same lens, now, if you look at rural Putnam County and urban core giant Duval County, you'll see threads of the same things, the same thinking, the same sort of idea of moving beyond, oh, we're gonna have robotics at these schools to, oh, somehow we've got to reach every child in the school day, otherwise we'll never get to true equity. But that came from all of us getting to know each other, working together, comparing success stories, and then taking seeds from each other, planting them and growing them into something beautiful, and then continuing to share across the ecosystem. Then those who were a little further behind or a little resistant to kind of go towards these things, then when they're ready, because we don't leave them out, we just never force them to do anything they're not ready to do. We leave an open invitation. Hey, we're all talking about this. You're welcome to join. Or, hey, come over and check out what they're doing. Maybe you'll like it. Maybe you can share something with them. So, so it's really cross, cross fertilization, communication, and providing a structure for that to happen. And it's also not being bought this or forget you. It's this is the goal. We've got to get kids workforce ready. We've got to give them a chance to prosper. What does that look like in Putnam County versus Duval County? And what common threads are there that are going to build those skills that are going to get us all there together? Always seems to come back down to that, that, uh, um, gosh, what I, I, um, Collaboration? No, I, the, uh, um, oh my gosh, my brain is so foggy today. Veronica, I say this a hundred times a day and then always forget it. And it'll come to me in a second. Anyway. Right. <laughs> save him, Reginald, save him. Right. While you think about that, Jeremy, hey, one thing for us inside of, uh, and this is true to any relationship, is really first and foremost transparency. Uh, you have to speak to your true self. There are some things that, uh, uh, you share with others because I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to build a trusting relationship with you. And if I'm afraid to be transparent, then of course it's hard to build trust. Like most things, those trusts come over time. And in this virtual space, you, you, there, there has to be certain situations where a person has to prove to you they, that they're trustworthy. When those situations don't, doesn't present themselves, it's hard to talk about, I do trust you when I haven't had a, a, a chance to show that. One of the things we, we've done in Rolls Royce, and I know this is more out of the DNI space, but this is really just in general, uh, allyship. Like, how do you speak up for a person or make sure a person understands, hey, I, I'm in your corner, so you can trust me. So anytime we can uh, do that on behalf of others, that also helps us to become more trustworthy among one another. But, uh, and I know those are general principles, but those apply to, I think, to industry, uh, ecosystems, and to all walks of life. Awesome. Uh, Reginald, as a follow-up, I, I hear news that Tom has a fantastic question for you. Tom, you want to go ahead and ask Reginald your question? So I don't know if it's fantastic or not, but I'll ask, and, and you bring up uh, the COVID environment, 
And I'm thinking of <clears throat> the most business and industry relationships, uh, you know, they, they come from personal interaction and we're in a time when personal interaction is very challenging. So what do y'all see are some of the challenges with building relationships and maintaining them? And what are some strategies to overcome them in this uh, still pandemic era? <clears throat> Great question. Just let's think about that. Let's just pause and really just think about just the changes in our the way we live. And now think about that in the change of how we do business. It's, it's, it's been tough for us even to service some of our customers. It's tough. And but what we are what we are trying to, what we are really focusing on is we we just need time, right? So in timing, think about it. As I am now working in a virtual space with a team. And we still hire people who've never seen Rolls Royce, but are on a team. And by the way, my name is, and this is what I do for the company. Welcome to the team. Well, that is a that is definitely a different dynamic within industry, whether you're small, medium, large, it's a different dynamic. But we, so as we are pivoting, especially for the larger corporation, you know, when you think about aircraft crap aircraft carrier, it takes time for us to really make that turn, even though we're making a turn. So you absolutely, you absolutely spot on. So as we talk about the time, there's nothing wrong with just touching base. Hey, by the way, I understand as you know, as we come in, as we are experiencing the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic, just want you to know as you continue to make your shift, we still on board and we right here to help you and assist you where we can. We, and by the way, we are making our pivot and we making changes, but we're still doing everything we can to serve our students, to serve, to serve our stakeholders. Just that, just that touch point, just to keep everybody in tune to what's taking place. But you understand where I am as an industry, where I might not be able to respond. I used to respond in a day. Now it's taken me a couple of weeks to respond to you because I'm, I'm making changes as well. So good question. Awesome. I think you know this about me by now. Uh, I'm a greedy person, right? And a wild-eyed optimist. Uh, if I see a flower truck in the neighborhood, I think they're probably coming to bring me flowers. Uh, so as an ecosystem lead, you know, I always like, I love it. I love that you're my friend. I love that you're giving me $10,000 a year all as well. But then I think, hmm, I wonder if Kathleen would give me 20. <laughs> well, I wonder if Kathleen would be on my board or I wonder if, you know, they have employees who, like, is there an elegant, appropriate, surefire way to ask about scaling or maybe even introducing me, Reginald, to your buddies? who don't work at Rolls Royce, maybe a competitor, like how do we scale this thing once it's good and healthy? So let me, let me highlight something I think the ecosystem leaders forget. Keep in mind, you are part of a national organization. So you understand scale. You see scale, you work in scale. So as you talk to me about scaling, speak on behalf of my national affiliation with the with something bigger than what you see with me here in Kansas and Tulsa, right? So I fully understand scale. And in addition to that, as I am thinking about scaling in my community, let me also introduce you to some other, I noticed that you have facilities in Chicago. I know you got a facility down in Texas. I know you got a facility down in Philadelphia. Let me introduce you to some other members. In fact, are you okay if I have a meeting with me, maybe four other members in different regions, different cities to kind of talk about what we're trying to do from a national perspective and how you can be part of something greater than just my, my perspective. And because of the relationship you have with me, I know XN personally. You know what? I like that XN. Let me start with you. What can we do to scale what you're doing? And then let's talk about how do I even have a greater reach across the nation? So, uh, and, I, and just a reminder to the leaders, talk from a national perspective. I, I want to reiterate that I have had some of our partners who are doing great things with us in Florida say to me, who's the Kathy in Colorado? Who's the Kathy in Boston? And 
that, you know, first you take a step back and you're like, what do you mean the Kathy of California? But we all know who they are from the wonderful work that the ecosystems has done. I know that if someone's looking for something in Pennsylvania, I go right to Judd Pittman, you know, I know who the people are. They might not be who you're going to work with, but they know the lay of their land, just like I know the lay of mine. And so that is absolutely true. That works so well from our perspective. And then you find local engagement increases. Many, my board is a beautiful mix of global, state, and local companies. And my global companies want to know how can how can we help in other areas? You know, to go back to CSX, they have um, wonderful railways that run in many places. So they did a great little behind the scenes look at the drones program at CSX for like a virtual field trip for us during the pandemic. Then they recorded that and I got that to my Kathy in New Jersey and my Kathy in other places. And now those children up in those other communities that CSX has a presence in, they've been able to, um, you know, have a greater reach with something that they already did. So, and I think that the larger corporations like to see that we're not just some little outliers doing some things here, but that we recognize just like the pandemic has made it so the job no longer is in Seattle, the job is where you live. So what is going on around the country and how can we now tap into these tremendous talented people who are not in our city, but who may be able to join us hybrid or remotely. Awesome. Is there, is there low hanging fruit or an easy way for an ecosystem leader to ask a business partner to help them meet other business leaders? Like, you know, a chamber meeting or a, you know, maybe a vendor summit or like, are there easy things like that that you found where it's like, oh, well, that was easy. You should have asked for that a long time ago that our ecosystem leaders could jump on. To me, it's, and now that things are, you know, in many places opening up a little bit, reach out to the Rotary Clubs, though you can't go in and ask for money, you can go in and talk about what you're doing and the business leaders don't necessarily know. So those little 40 minute lunchtime speaking engagements are a wonderful place to tell your story and to get people interested in your work. That to me, those are low hanging fruit. Many of them meet every week. Some of them are meeting virtually. And that means they need at least 52 speakers a year. <laughs> right. The other thing as we are beginning to reconvene, don't forget, even if you, even if your organization is not part of a, a huge signature STEM event, go to the event, see who's at the event. <laughs> See what industry leaders at the event, because keep in mind, sometimes you will have industry partners who are not necessarily sponsors, but might be serving as a speaker, might be serving as a judge, and they might have their logo on. Inter go up, walk, introduce yourself. Hey, we glad to see you here today. Uh, one of the things my organization does, introduce yourself to them because they there, right? So they are they already there at some point, someone has reached out to them to support. So any signature event, any small event that's taking place that come across your calendar, go to the event. Where are your ecosystem logo stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? And, yeah. And to add now, I don't recommend that, hand out flyers, but hey, talk to them. Right. Have a card. <laughs> and we're coming up on National Computer Science Education Week, the uh, first right. week of December. People are doing an hour of code all over the world, all over the country. And there's a little place where schools can request an industry person to zoom in and just speak for a couple minutes. I mean, gosh, what a low hanging fruit, easy way to get engagement is let industry know CS Ed Week is here. We could use 15 minutes of your time to zoom in and talk to some kids about your job. Actually, let me be brief here real quick, because here's the importance of why you go to those events, because as much as you can send me an email with all the details, once I speak to you and I can feel your passion, 
that makes me want to touch to reach back out to you because I understand, hey, this is a person who gets it. So, so that's always important. I can feel your passion. I can see your passion without you just coming to me, talking to me about some commercial, all the wonderful work you're doing, but I can see it inside of you. Yep. Awesome. I think that, I think that one-on-one really does help. And I see that Reginald actually cares, you know, like it's easy to go, oh, he's, he makes fancy cars. Like he doesn't care about this. But when I talk to you, I see that you do. So I think sometimes ecosystem leaders are super intimidated by business. And I think maybe business is super intimidated by education. And I think one of the things that intimidates us is maybe my main thing is working with elementary students. So for me to persuade you guys to throw down big bucks for kids that are in the third grade, when it's going to be nine, 10, 20 years before you'll see that, that scares me and makes me not want to talk to you. Do you guys have parting words for our ecosystem leaders that will help us get over that hump of being intimidated by our business partners? Let me jump in real quick because because I have this conversation a lot with elementary teachers or those who are I call serving those students who are not quite in middle school, high school. Keep in mind, I'm, I'm not going to any ecosystem or partner with any organization for my workforce development. That, that's not that's not how that works. I know I have to reach beyond college or I, there's other ways I do that. But I am concerned about the quality of life in my community. I am concerned about how we are educating kids in my community. And I am concerned about keeping students engaged in this work because a lot of you'll find a lot of time the people engaged in this because when I was in the third grade, nobody talked to me about being an engineer. I don't want that to happen to all the wonderful kids in my neighborhood or in my community or even in my state. So you so you approach me from that perspective. As we are educating students to become you, as we are educating students to become the next, they need to see a person like you. They need to hear you. There's places where I like for you to get engaged with helping some of my elementary teachers understand the impact they have on students pursuing certain careers. That's how you start. That's the conversation I have. Don't talk to me about, oh, yeah, because come talk to my third graders because one day they could be an engineer in your company. In the third grade, I won't even be here when they come to my company. But I do want to see that those students are achieving, and I want to talk to them about math and science. And even and even though you see me as an engineer today, when I was in the third grade, I might not have liked math, but I could do the math. And then somebody helped me to understand why I need to do the math. That's the conversation you have at the younger age group. It's about the quality of life. And we all know the importance of education for all students in all zip codes and all regions. That's why we are in this business. That's, just, that's why our businesses succeed because of our richness of our communities. And we want to engage even in the earlier grades to continue to keep the vitality of our communities in place. Okay, Reginald, you've done it now. Like, will you, I know we're drawing from the vault of Reginald's brain. Will you remind us of like, not just so ROI, but you had all these RO other things and they were just like salve for my wounds. Do you remember those? Like, you remember those? Oh, man. Well, Jeremy remembers it. We loved it. It's like, you told us like, don't just think about return on investment, which is what we usually think our business right. is. There's return right. on like, you know, uh, joy of life in our community, there's return on all these other things. And so I thought when you said that, talked about that last time, it was really good. I'm sure Jeremy has that somewhere. Jeremy, bring that up real quick <laughs> so I can read it again. Like, Jeremy, you, and you're in life. So when, do you remember what Reginald said last time? I, I, I know don't off the top of my head, but it is a thing it we can dig up if Reginald doesn't have it because right. it, was, it was gold. It was gold. Yeah, because one of the things we do talk about inside our company when we talk about engaging is not always just a return on the investment of we're going to hire somebody. We're talking about the return on our investment in terms of making sure our employees are engaged in their communities. They stay with us longer. We also talk about the, re the return on the loyalty of your community. We have an impact on that. And then we talk about the return on, even when I drive down the street and see students out doing something, if there's a way I can make sure those students have particular activities. Well, if I can get engaged with that and make and, and see if those students find something, that is a return I get to bring back into the company. By the way, I'm helping an organization start a program for some kids I saw just down the street. Those returns impact the we call the productivity and the creativity inside the company when people are engaged throughout their lives around this whole stem profession that is the return and it's not always by the way we're going to partner with you because i'm looking for the next uh, the, the next outstanding industrial engineer or mechanical engineer 
I'm, yeah, I'm trying to yeah. have an impact on my community as well. That is, yeah. that is the return. It is. I can tell you, we've got a TEALS program here and the people who are the volunteers in several of my board companies, as the board members were describing, they lit up talking about the positive impact on the employees volunteering and how they light up and it just creates this positive energy that makes people want to help and do more. Uh, Exan, I've got to jump in for, for my own enlightened <laughs> self-interest right now because, um, so the, the work that I've done in, in the OSM and, and, and helping other organizations in line with what you're just talking about, I bet every month I have someone in a school say to me, man, I wish, man, I wish there was a way for me to work with people in business and industry and not every month, but darn near every month. I have someone at the university level or business and industry say to me, man, I wish, man, I wish I could get into schools and work with teachers. And I've always thought, I always think to myself, you know, what we need is a uh, is like speed dating. How do we get these people together? And Caitlin mentioned something in the chat that I would love for her to share really quickly because I because I think it gets to a little bit of that speed dating idea. Caitlin, are you there with us? Hi. Um, I hope my microphone's working. I think it, it is. is. It my is. Name. Um, yeah, I was just talking in the chat about a program that we started called Classroom Connections. Um, I've I've been calling it basically like. It's kind of like Tinder, where we have um, educators who fill out a form saying, you know, I'm interested in these subjects. This is what grade I teach. Uh, and then we have STEM professionals who fill out, this is the field I'm in. These are the age groups I feel comfortable presenting to. These are the types of presentations I like to give. Um, and then uh, we just match them up based on overlapping interest. Um, and it was, it was extremely popular last year and it was great. Um, and like I said in the, in the chat, um, it gave us the ability to say, you know, like here's a presenter who um, is in a pretty niche field, and you know, based on you know all the information they submitted, it sounds like they are looking to talk more to high school students. So let's pair them up with a high school uh, group. Um, so it, that worked out really well for us, and it was pretty simple. It's just all operating out of uh, Google Forms. Caitlin, I, I love that so much. And it also brings to my kind of side note here. I know that uh, you don't all know this, but I know that Veronica is already peer pressuring Caitlin into uh, creating one of those eSpace videos um, for this concept. If you don't remember, it's been a while since we've talked about eSpace. We all, every one of these ecosystems is doing something that nobody else is doing and is brilliant and amazing. So we're asking everybody to think about what those things are and to create a video. And before you, before you get scared, we're not talking highly polished, beautiful, amazing videos, although they can be. We're literally talking about, you know, turning your, uh, your FaceTime camera on and recording yourself talking for three to 15 minutes about the process. Um, and I, I'm really hoping, uh, and, and I actually see in our kind of side chat that Caitlin has already agreed. So, so stay tuned to, to see that one from Caitlin, but think about that for you as well, please. Um, what we miss most about being together is the opportunity to have those, uh, those, uh, those impromptu meetings at the donut table where we hear about the little program that you're doing and we ask you some questions and we learn about it and we replicate. Um, so please uh, make sure to, to can look out for the one from Caitlin and think about what you can add. Um, so Exan, we've only got a few minutes. So before we close, do you have any final questions for, for our brilliant panelists? I just so appreciate Kathleen and Reginald. And I, I wonder, you know, as we prepare for the next year, people are doing budgets and kind of strategic planning for the next year. If you could give these guys, what would you say to our ecosystem to really set them up for success in 22? Exan, can you repeat that? I was getting something from <laughs> recording or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just real I'm quick, say that it again. A lot of the ecosystem, you know, it's budget time, strategic right. plan for next year. So if you could give them one or two points, like be sure to do these two things to set you up for success in 22, what would those be? Oh, boy, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, um, I, I got one, which is um, right now is the time that many of our corporate partners are thinking about their budget for 2022 from the corporate responsibility. So 
companies you're interested in, either look on those websites because many of them have grant applications that you can fill out and many of them for next year are opening right now. Let me speak from the, uh, I call the large companies. So a lot of us, you know, our budget season starts using around September. And, and the reality is as things are being either reduced or held just to get us through the next year in terms of the business, a lot of our budgets are just being, just really being the same or some being reduced. Uh, one, one of the things you can talk to us about is as we know that there are some budget constraints going into 2022 for all of us, there are still ways that we can engage with one another that might not take a lot of spending, but we still can have an impact by you just being alongside as a partner and keep, and, and as we come out of this era, as we come out of this pandemic, then we'll come back together and we'll talk about how we can maybe fund some things to have a greater impact to catch everybody back up. Just a true transparent conversation with us, knowing that you understand where I am, because it's hard for you to ask me for budget. If yesterday I was in a meeting to talk about how we're going to make sure we don't lay off part of our part of our, our workforce. So so just be just be transparent to our needs. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. Over to Jeremy. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. This webinar recording will be available on the STEM Ecosystems website soon. And the follow-up email you'll receive will have the links that were shared by our team in the chat. A couple of reminders. We want to remind everyone, that, uh, particularly ecosystem leaders and their community foundations, to join us for an intimate discussion tomorrow at noon Eastern time. For the giant community of practice community, join us on December 7th for a webinar with Lab Exchange. Uh, maybe you remember learning about Harvard's Lab Exchange tool last year, but a lot has changed. A lot has been added and expanded. So join the STEM Learning Ecosystems and Lab Exchange for an interactive webinar to learn about these new features, including an incredible new mentorship tool, and to have an opportunity to use them yourselves. Ecosystem leads, educators, and curriculum leaders will learn about the new mentor finding tool and about the more than 13,000 resources available to the students in your region. Details about that webinar and how to register coming soon, but you can go ahead and book it for December 7th. Finally, and maybe, maybe the most exciting to me, um, please make sure that you register for the June 2022 convening Ooh, in yeah. Bay City, Michigan. <laughs> we are finally going to knock on wood, be together again. I miss all of you. I miss um, I miss being in person and not in my my creepy basement where I spend most of my life. So please sign up uh, just so we can hang out if for no other reason. Um, we're really, really excited to see you there. Thank you, Kathleen and Reginald for your expertise. And thank you, Exan, for all of your work bringing this expertise to us all. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>